introduction. So Max Brivok is a senior lecturer at the University of Edinburgh, and he has also worked extensively on computation. He has uh, participated in many of the debates that uh, have uh, sparkled in the literature in the past years. He has also worked on neural representations, where the, uh, he has examined the, the possibility that neural representations might be fictions, and he has argued against that. And he has also worked on uh, extended cognition. So uh, today he's going to talk, uh, to, talk to us about uh, information and representation in probabilistic models of cognition. So I pass the word to, to Mark. Just, just, just one second here. I'm trying to yeah, uh, sure. translate the Hebrew into or guess what the Hebrew is in English. Uh, maybe someone can help me open the file here. indeed and thank you very much to Orly and Mir for um, inviting me here um, to this wonderful event. Um, so um, this talk is going to be about the slogan that cognition is information processing and what I'm going to be trying to do in the talk is try to unpack that slogan in more precise terms. So in particular what I'm going to do is I'm going to argue that there's more than one sense in which cognition is information <coughs> processing I'm going to distinguish a traditional or long-standing sense in which uh, folks have claimed that cognition is information processing from a new sense which has kind of appeared in the recent literature. And I'm going to argue that philosophers should pay attention to um, this contrast. So that is essentially the talk there in one slide. OK, so here's the plan. Um, in the first section, I'm going to talk a little bit about information and introduce uh, what, um, what I'm going to take information to be in this context. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the traditional relationship between um, information and cognition that uh, folks have argued for. Uh, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about problems that have faced that traditional relationship or challenges that have faced that traditional relationship. Then I'm going to introduce the new relationship, and then hopefully I'll have time to look at one um, case study <coughs> around um, a statistical inference technique, independent component analysis, and then I'll make a few remarks by way of uh, conclusion. Okay. So, on to the first section. So, when you ask the question, what is information, um, the first move um, to make is really to distinguish between um, everyday notions of information um, connected with folks' <coughs> use of the term information in everyday life um, and uh, more technical notions of information. So the everyday notions are very closely connected with folks' concepts about meaning, knowledge, uh, intention, communication. Um, the technical notions are really um, quite different. These are um, precisely defined um, notions of information that are introduced for, usually for very, very specific purposes um, to capture very specific patterns. The technical notions have rather complicated and murky relationship with the folk notions of information. I'm not going to talk about the relationship between the technical notions and the folk notions at all in this talk. Um, so the purpose of, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus solely on um, the technical notions <coughs> of information. So, you only have to glance at the literature to see there are a bunch of different um, precise technical notions of information out there. Here are just three. There are lots of them. So um, the one which um, is kind of most well-known, gets most publicity, especially in the context of uh, cognitive science, is Shannon information, which is concerned, as we're going to see in a second, with statistical properties and, uh, and their correlation, statistical properties of events and their correlations. <laughs> 
Um, <coughs> there's also other technical notions, fissure information, concerned with slightly different statistical properties, um, Chaitlin's algorithmic information, which is aimed to measure the um, complexity of data structures or streams, and um, there are many more. What I just want to point out at the moment is that each of these is distinct. Each of them has a different definition. Um, they're not unrelated. They're interesting formal relationships between um, these different uh, technical notions of information. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm only going to focus on Shannon information. Okay, So I'm not going to talk about any of these um, other um, technical um, specifications of um, the notion of information. OK, so only Shannon information. So what is Shannon information? Um, now, we've been through this um, a couple of times before in, in, in other talks, but um, I would like to go through it again because it's going to matter a great deal for um, what I'm going to claim later um, in the talk. <coughs> um, so for, to have Shannon information or for Shannon information to occur, um, you need a, an ingredient. You need an ingredient which um, I'm going to um, call um, an ensemble. So we define an ensemble as um, an ensemble X is a triple, um, X, A, X, P, X, where the outcome little x is the value of a random variable, um, which takes on one of a set of possible values, A1, A2, and so forth, um, each having um, probabilities P1, P2, and so forth. Uh, with those um, probabilities, with those Ps, um, satisfying the standard conditions on, um, on pro a probability measure across those um, um, uh, those um, uh, values of the of the random variable. Okay, so I just want to pull out um, what are the essential bits from um, this definition of the ensemble. So the first thing is that you need a random variable. So you need something which can take on a bunch of different uh, a bunch of different values, a bunch of different outcomes. So there have to be various possible outcomes, and each of those outcomes has to have a probability associated with it. Okay. So in order to have Shannon information, you need a random variable, and you need various possible outcomes for that random <coughs> variable, and you need a well-defined um, probability measure across those possible outcomes. Okay, so that's the, that's the kind of the main, um, the, the important bit from, from that ingredient. Now, there's a very tight relationship between the presence of Shannon <coughs> information and um, the presence of an ensemble. So in order to have Shannon information, um, you've got to have an ensemble. Okay? So if you don't have the ensemble, if you don't have a random variable with uh, probabilities, then simply you don't have Shannon information at all. Okay? So it's a necessary condition for having uh, Shannon information. And actually, it turns out um, that the converse of that is also true. Okay? So because of the way in which Shannon information is defined, which we're going to see in a second, um, having an ensemble is also a sufficient condition for having um, Shannon information. So once you have a random variable, probabilities for the various outcomes of that random variable, you have satisfied everything that is needed in order for um, Shannon's definitions of um, information to apply um, to that particular um, system in question. Okay? So once you have an ensemble, ipso facto, you've got Shannon information. You've got the um, definitions that Sh of Shannon uh, truly apply um, to those um, particular cases, that particular, those particular outcomes and ensembles. <coughs> okay, so there's a tight relationship between Shannon information and ensembles. This is going to matter a great deal for what I'm going to claim later in the, in the talk. Now, whenever you ask what something is, it's often helpful to get an idea of what sort of entities, or what, whenever you ask what sort of thing a property is, it's often a good idea to get an idea of what sort of entities have that kind of property or that we predicate that kind of property of. And there are a variety of different kinds of things that are um, attributed um, Shannon information or that can be legitimately attributed Shannon information. So the outcomes, the individual outcomes of an ensemble can be attributed Shannon information. Um, the ensemble as a whole can be attributed Shannon information. Okay? And also pairs of ensembles or joint ensembles. So if you've got an ordered pair of ensembles, two random variables, there are also um, well-defined um, Shannon information theoretic uh, measures which apply to pairs. 
So let's have a look at each one of those um, very quickly. So Shannon information of a particular outcome. So um, the Shannon information associated with a particular outcome um, of uh, the ensemble is defined as um, uh, the log of one over the probability of um, that outcome occurring. Okay. So the only point I want to pull out here is that information, Shannon information, is is is, is a function um, is a function solely of probability. So it's a function of probability, and it's a function only of probability. A one way to think of this to a first approximation is that Shannon information is a kind of an inversion and stretching of probability. It's a kind of a rescaling of probability. So to a first approximation, you can think of Shannon information as, um, uh, as, a, as a kind of a rescaling of the probability, as a, as a kind of a transformation, of the, a formal transformation of probability. Probability is the only ingredient which is going into this. So ontologically speaking, if you're worried about the foundations, as long as you've got the probabilities there, as long as you've fixed the probabilities, you've fixed the Shannon information associated with a particular outcome. Okay. The Shannon information of an ensemble, um, X, is defined as um, the um, information associated with each outcome um, weighted by um, the probability of that outcome occurring. Okay. So this is, if you like, the expected value of um, the information um, associated with any given random outcome of um, your random variable. Okay. Now, this measure is totally <laughs> useless if um, your um, random variable is only ever going to have um, one outcome. Okay. However, if your random variable is going to have lots and lots and lots of outcomes over time, you're going to run this many, many, many times, and you're interested in the long-term behavior of the system, then this is often a measure which you're going to be interested in. So if you're interested in long-term behavior, it often makes sense to look at the information of the ensemble as a whole, the average information associated with, with the outcomes produced by that ensemble. Okay, so um, information, Shannon information is defined for outcomes of ensembles, for the ensemble as a whole, and it's also defined for pairs of ensembles. And there are a large number of uh, information theoretic measures which are defined over pairs of ensembles. So suppose you've got a pair of ensembles, two ensembles X and Y, two different random variables. Those random variables might be independent random variables. They might be, dep they might be dependent random variables, whichever. Okay. There are various measures defined over the pair. So one measure is the joint information, the joint Shannon information associated with that pair, which is, if you've got a pair X and Y, it's just the average information associated with the outcome being both X and Y averaged over the um, probabilities, sorry, weighted by the probabilities of both X and Y occurring. Okay. Another um, very important uh, measure which is um, associated with um, uh, pairs of ensembles is um, the conditional, Shannon conditional information. Um, suppose you've got um, two um, random variables, X and Y, and suppose that Y um, has already occurred, okay? so Y has got a particular outcome, um, then unless X and Y are completely independent from each other, that's going to affect, the occurrence of Y is going to affect the probabilities associated with X, okay? So if it affects the probabilities associated with X, it's going to affect the information, the Shannon information associated with X. So that is the conditional Shannon information of X given Y. And in this case, um, we don't assume any particular X and Y, and um, we average over all of the X's and Y's weighted by the probability of them occurring. Uh, mutual information is another very important measure, which again only applies to pairs of ensembles. Um, Gualtiero mentioned mutual information. Um, so um, we said that um, if X and Y are not independent random variables, then if Y occurs, then that's going to affect the probabilities associated with X. It's going to affect the information and then information associated with X. So the mutual information it's just a measure of how much it affects, how much the occurrence of Y affects information, Shannon information associated, how much the occurrence of Y affects the Shannon information associated with X. So how much of a change in the information associated with X uh, takes place 
if y occurs. Again, I've averaged over um, all of the x's and y's uh, weighted by their probabilities. Okay, so points I want to get out of this. First, Shannon information in each case is always just going to be some function, some transformation of the probability. The probability is the only um, ingredient going into it. Okay, it's the invariable going into it. And the Shannon information is just some formal transformation of that. Okay? And Shannon information is applying to a variety of different things in each case, and it's defined over a different application for, for a variety of different things. It's defined to apply to individual outcomes of an ensemble, and to ensembles as a, on a whole, as in the case of average information, and to pairs of ensembles, ordered pairs of ensembles, as in the case of joint information, conditional information, and mutual information. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the traditional um, relationship that folks have envisaged between Shannon information and uh, cognition. Okay, so let's think about a little bit about what cognition is. So if you take the view from 30,000 feet on what cognition is, most folks agree that in some sense cognition involves certain states of the system being transformed by certain dynamics. Okay. Now, the states, the cognitive states of the system might be a variety of different things. There's a lot of disagreement about what those um, cognitive states are. And um, so many folks think that at least some of those states are representations. Uh, lots of folks think that many of the cognitive states are not representations, non-representational states. And um, so there are lots of different options for what the states are, what the cognitive states are. And there are also a lot of different options for what the dynamics are that link those states, you know, that connect the states together. So one option is computational dynamics. Another option is to endorse some you know, purely causal story about how one state produces another. And there are also the kind of dynamics which you see in dynamical system models in uh, cognition, where the dynamics are described by some, something that looks like a differential equation. So there are lots and lots of different options for describing um, both the states and the dynamics. Now, on the traditional conception or the long-standing conception of the how Shannon information is relevant to cognition, um, it really comes in here. Okay, so this is what um, Gualtiero was talking about in his uh, talk. So Shannon information is somehow going to help you to explain um, what how cognitive, how representational cognitive states come about. So Shannon information is going to somehow help with uh, what's been called um, the problem of representation. So this is exactly what Gualtiero's talk was about. So the problem of representation is how do some states of the system, some cognitive states or some neural states, get to be representations at all? How do they get to have representational content? How do they get to be about stuff, for example, in the environment? And um, not just any answer to this question counts as a legitimate or a good answer. And um, what folks want as an answer to that question is a naturalistic answer. They want an answer which says um, what makes something a representation solely in terms of objective physical relationships um, involving the organism and involving its environment and perhaps other things. So the problem of representation, really, really hard problem, long-standing problem in philosophy of mind. The thought is Shannon information is going to um, help us to make progress um, on that problem. And this movement has become known as informational semantics, has kind of morphed a little bit into infotel semantics. Um, and Dretzky is kind of, as Gualtiero was saying, was, was, was one of the people who, who, who got greatest credit for kicking this program off. And the idea is that what makes something a representation, what makes a cognitive state a representation, is something about the Shannon information it carries plus some other conditions. Okay, so no one thinks that Shannon information is going to be sufficient for representation, but it's supposed to be doing a significant amount of the work in fixing representational status and representational content. Okay, so roughly... Uh, Versions of informational semantics take something of this kind of form. So they make some kind of claim of the following, um, the following kind of schema. 
that a cognitive state, a particular cognitive state R, that the um, cognitive agent might be in, drawn from a large number of large population of possible cognitive states it could be in. Um, that cognitive state R represents a stimulus, an environmental stimulus S, again drawn from a variety of environmental stimuli that could occur, um, only if an information theoretic relationship, and there's disagreement about exactly what that information theoretic relationship is, holds between S and R. And there are a large number of proposals out there in the literature on specific information theoretic relationships which are supposed to do this job of helping us to establish the facts about representation. So Gretzky argued for um, something like um, perfect um, correlation between um, the stimulus occurring and um, the, um, uh, the cognitive state occurring. And uh, <coughs> very famously criticised many times for that this is a totally unrealistic condition. For, for, for actual organisms, so the vast majority of people have moved away from requiring that there be perfect um, correlation between the, 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 the stimulus and, 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 the, and the state in order for representation to occur. Um, Millikan um, also endorses a, a kind of a, a high correlation view, precisely how high the correlation needs to be is a, is, 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 is a subtle matter and Millikan has a, has a nuanced answer. Um, to that question, which is going to rely on a, on a separate factor, which I'm going to mention in a second. Um, and um, folks like Nick Shea, um, Andreas Garantino, and Gualtiero have taken a, a different and interesting tack, which is rather than focus on um, correlations, instead focus on probability raising. Okay? So um, under some conditions, the organism has this cognitive state R, and in other conditions, the organism doesn't have that cognitive state R. If the probability of the um, um, stimulus occurring when it has R is higher than the probability of the stimulus occurring when it doesn't have R, then that is the condition which needs to be met in order for um, representation, natural representation, um, to occur. Okay, and there, there, there are lots and lots of other um, um, proposals on, on, on relationships between R and S that would help us with representation. Okay, so Gualtier also mentioned various conditions that you might propose in regarding mutual information between S and R. And there's a massive space of possible proposals here that you could make. Okay, so let me just say a few words about um, the problems with this traditional relationship. Now, I don't mean this in any way to be a criticism of this program. Um, I'm a big fan of the informational semantics. Um, what this is more aim to do is to acknowledge that the program has yet to achieve conclusive success in uh, naturalizing representation using um, information or probabilistic relations. Um, and um, to really just highlight what I take to be the, the, the kind of the main challenge which, which, which the view faces. Um, so the main challenge which I think affects these kind of views is that um, any of the information theoretic um, relationships which are proposed between S and R um, tend to be far too liberal as regards um, attributing representational content. So here's a simple example. So suppose that we've got um, two random variables. S is whether uh, a stone is dropped into a pond, either true or false. R is whether um, ripples occur at the edge of the pond, um, true or false. Um, now, forget about Dredsky for a second, because no, nobody's in the business of getting um, perfect correlations between S and R. Um, but there's going to be a, a pretty high correlation between um, S and R in this case. Okay? So uh, there's going to be a pretty high correlation between ripples occurring and objects being dropped into the pond. Um, the probability raising measure is also going to be um, satisfied in this case. So um, in the conditions that um, you do see ripples, um, it's going to be um, a higher probability that uh, something has been dropped into the pond than the condition uh, that you don't see ripples. So if you don't see ripples and something has been dropped into the pond, um, then something very unusual must have occurred. Um, uh, so, uh, so the probability raising measure is going to be satisfied as well. Now, lots and lots of these accounts have similar kinds of problems, and the folks who uh, canvass these accounts are really well aware of it. And in general, the problem is, is that the kind of probabilistic dependencies that these accounts um, uh, uh, claim are extremely common in the world. So it's extremely common to have um, you know, 
high correlation between different, uh, different events in the world or probability raising uh, to be satisfied between the relationship of different events in the world. However, semantic relations seem to be extremely uncommon in the world. Okay? So representation is something which doesn't occur that often. So there's got to be something pretty substantial. There must be some extra condition, uh, extra necessary condition on representation, which is going to be ruling out these kind of um, cases as counting as genuine cases of representation. Okay, so the tack that folks usually take here, which um, it seems an eminently sensible tack, is to say, well, what we should do is we should understand representation not as a two-place relation, but as a three-place relation, so go Persian. Okay, so representation is a three-place relation between the cognitive state, R, the environmental stimulus, S, and some user. Okay. Let's not say exactly what the user is for the time being. Some user could be could, could be the whole organism, might be something else. So probabilistic, mere probabilistic dependency between one and two, between the cognitive state and the environmental stimulus, is clearly not sufficient for um, representation. It's just far too common. <laughs> Um, but how about if we add the condition that, in addition to the probabilistic dependency, there also has to be a user who either exploits or has exploited or could exploit, depending on exactly what kind of uh, account you want to run, um, that probabilistic relationship between one and two. So this seems to at least have the potential for adding a lot of extra resources to constrain the facts about representation. Okay, so the general schema for informational semantics, which lots and lots of folks um, now I run with and try to develop, is that um, a cognitive state R represents a stimulus S for some user U only if an information theoretic relationship between S and R obtains and some further conditions, which need extra spelling out, regarding U are met involving U's exploitation or potential exploitation or past exploitation of that information theoretic relationship. Okay. The big problem which, uh, uh, with this kind of proposal, a big outstanding challenge, um, uh, which um, you know, I'm indebted to, 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 the, to the work of Rosa for um, uh, doing uh, uh, some, uh, for helping me to, 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 to fully appreciate, is um, the problem of naturalizing the user. So we said that a good answer to the problem of representation had to appeal to only objective physical relationships. So it couldn't involve appealing to full-blown cognitive agents. Okay, that wouldn't account as naturalizing uh, representation. So the user has to be something less than the full-blown cognitive agent human being. Um, so maybe the user could be something like a part of their brain, a specific neural population, maybe it could be a single neuron. Um, it's very difficult to um, naturalize the user in a way that makes the user less than the entire human agent. Uh, but still avoid the kind of um, liberality worries that dogged the uh, first uh, attempt to spell out informational semantics. Okay. So I say this by way of summary. I don't, I, I don't intend this, you know, the, in, this in no way is, is suggested as, as some kind of um, uh, 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 conclusive criticism of the view. I think this is a live research project, but it's just a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a hard and non-trivial um, problem to, uh, to address. Okay, so... Now that we've got the um, kind of traditional way in which um, Shannon information enters into cognition and focus, let's look at a quite different way in which Shannon information is entering into cognition, which has kind of appeared much more recently in um, cognitive science, in particular um, cognitive neuroscience. Now, the starting point for this new way in which um, cognition involves um, Shannon information um, is the assumption that cognition involves representations. Okay, so the previous view <coughs> tried to establish this, okay, or tried to somehow um, explain how um, cognition involves representations. On this view, we just take it for granted. Okay, so we just help ourselves to representations. So the aim here is not to use Shannon information to naturalize representation, okay? We just help ourselves to wrap representations, and we assume that there's nothing problematic about positing um, representations in explaining uh, our cognitive capacities. Okay. Now, the representations uh, on this view, which um, we um, help ourselves to, 
at least some of those representations are um, probabilistic representations. Okay? So I'm going to say a little bit more uh, in a second about what a, a probabilistic representation is uh, in the context of cognition. Um, the important thing to note here, the important contrast which I'm going to try to emphasize in the talk, is um, <laughs> that the probabilities associated with the representation are not probabilities associated with the occurrence of the representational vehicle. Okay? So how probable it is for R to occur given certain stimulus or you know, vice versa. So they're not probabilities associated with the occurrence of the representational vehicle. That is the um, a quantity which uh, preoccupies Dredsky, Millikan, Shea, uh, Scarantino, Piccinini, and, 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 and so forth. The probabilities are instead associated with the representational content. Okay, so they feature in the content, and they are not associated with the occurrence, the brute occurrence or non-occurrence of the vehicle. I'm going to say a little bit more in a second just to make that, that contrast a little bit clearer. Okay, so first of all, um, what is a probabilistic representation? What does a probabilistic representation look like? So we've already said that we're going to help ourselves to the assumption that cognition involves representations. And as Gualtiero um, very clearly um, uh, argued for in his, in his talk, um, what this is, um, uh, the general way in which folks use this is to say that cognition involves, in many cases, um, hypotheses that the organism has or bits of the organism have about the environment. And the environment includes its body and the rest of its neural system. So cognition involves um, the organism having hypotheses about the environment, and those hypotheses might um, represent the world in such and such a way. So they might represent, so the organism might have a hypothesis that there's a line over there, or that there's a face over here, or that um, it has, the cognitive agent has this location, or that it has this orientation. Okay. So cognition involves um, lots and lots of representations of the environment. So if we kind of rewind time back to the 1970s, 1980s, um, the traditional kinds of representations that were attributed to the cognitive agent or to parts of the cognitive agent um, involved um, representations of single states of affairs. So here we have um, a, a kind of a uh, line drawing of, um, of I think the, the fourth bridge and um, so it was thought that representations something like this would occur early in the visual system okay so these are representations which represent a single state of affairs either there's a line here or there isn't if there's a line there then this is shown by there being wiped off if there isn't then there isn't so either there's a line there or there isn't a line there so it represents a single state of affairs that's either true or not true um, in the world. And if, as theorists, if we want to describe the content of um, these traditional forms of representation, what we do is we give its truth conditions or its accuracy conditions. So we say under exactly which conditions this representation would be veridical. Okay. So those are the kind of traditional forms of uh, cognitive representation. And I want to contrast those with um, uh, the kinds of representations that folks are positing to cognitive systems all over the place nowadays. And these are um, probabilistic representations. So roughly speaking, the contrast is that probabilistic, while traditional representations only represent a single state of affairs, probabilistic representations are going to represent multiple states of affairs with some probability mass associated with each one of those and different states of affairs, different outcomes. I will never wear a theorist describing um, what the content of those representations is. We don't do so by giving truth conditions or accuracy conditions. Instead, we specify the content by giving a probability distribution or by um, giving a probability density function. So here's a probability distribution. So this might, you might imagine here, this is very, very schematic, but much, much simplified, but you might imagine here that there's a cognitive state and it's representing multiple states of affairs. Some particular value could be one, it could be three, it could be seven. And it has, uh, um, it's associating probability with each one of those um, possible outcomes. 
So it has a high probability associated with three and lower probabilities associated with two and seven. Okay? So it's representing multiple states of affairs, not a single thing, either on or off and it has a measure of probability associated with each one of those multiple outcomes. Here, this is a probability density function, which you know, is much, much, much more common to um, see in attributions of probabilistic representations nowadays in, in, in cognitive science. Um, the difference here is just you know, um, that the, the possible outcomes are an infinite number of possible outcomes. So you associate the probability maps with the area under this curve between two different values. So, the organism is very, very confident that this value of this thing in the environment is between 0 and 1, but um, not very confident that it's between 1 and 1.5. Okay. So we use these probability distributions or probability density functions to describe what are the different outcomes being represented and also the probability mass which the organism is associating with those different outcomes. Now, you might think, okay, well, that's all very interesting. You know, you've described what a probabilistic representation is. Why on earth do you think um, organisms, cognitive organisms like ourselves, have probabilistic representations? Why isn't it just these? Why doesn't it just have all these? Um, well, you know, one of the, kind of the big changes in um, cognitive neuroscience in the past 20 years has been the acknowledgement that it seems rational to attribute probabilistic representations in almost every case to organisms rather than traditional forms of, of representation. And very roughly speaking, the kind of argument runs like this. So imagine that um, you're trapped inside a room and um, you've got um, uh, a connection to the outside. You've got some noisy wires to the outside. So you might have like a video feed coming in from the outside. It's very, very noisy though. Okay. Uh, if you want to survive and um, keep surviving and prospering, it's best to start making hypotheses about what's going on outside the room. Okay? Now, since your video feed is very noisy, and since it only gives you very incomplete information about what's going on in the environment, um, you can't be certain about what's going on in the environment. And it's best to keep a number of options open. Okay, so you might see a face looming towards you on the video feed. You're 90% sure that this is the face of your loved one, but uh, your 10% is very, very fuzzy, so your 10% um, um, think that, well, um, this might be your worst enemy, okay? So in your deliberations, it's um, best to keep these options open. So whenever you're in making your inferences, whenever you're deliberating, whenever you're deciding what action to take, you should factor in all of these options, and you should weight them in importance in your um, deliberations by your uncertainty about each, okay? So you should weight the hypothesis that it's your loved one more heavily than it's your worst enemy, but not completely discount the possibility that it's your worst enemy. Okay. Now, what I've described here is um, essentially a job description. I've given you a job description for probabilistic representation. So you need something like probabilistic representation in order to do this task or to do it in an optimal way. And the thing to notice is that your brain is pretty much in the same epistemic position to you trapped inside the room. So there are a couple of wrinkles with that, but roughly speaking, in terms of informal motivation, um, your brain is in a similar epistemic position. So it kind of makes sense for your brain if it's going to represent the environment, given that it has incomplete and noisy information from the environment, to use probabilistic representations and to keep those representations probabilistic as late as possible. So keep information about variants, for example, uh, in there as late as possible in decision making. Okay, so what's the new relationship between um, uh, cognition and um, representation? Uh, sorry, cognition and Shannon information? Well, first of all, we're gonna assume that cognition involves representation. Um, those representations, um, as we've seen, have probabilities associated with them, okay? So they have probabilities associated with their content, so they represent different states of affairs, each with a probability or each with a probability mass associated with them. <coughs> and we saw in the first part of the talk that once you've got probabilities, once you're employing probabilities, then you've satisfied everything that you need for employing um, Shannon information. You've satisfied the conditions needed for Shannon information to apply. So once you've got the probabilities, then Shannon information is coming along for free. 
So therefore, your representations have associated Shannon information. Shannon information associated with their content, not with the occurrence of their vehicle. Miles, Trotsky, and so forth. And I've been focusing on Okay. So the old sense of information processing was the Shannon information was associated with the vehicles occurring. The new sense, which is kind of emerging, um, is the information, the Shannon information, is associated with the content. Now, I just want to be a little bit careful here, so I want to clarify that my claim is definitely not that cognitive states represent Shannon information. Okay, I think that this is almost certainly um, false and probably uh, a, a, a completely um, inaccurate way of, of, of summarizing what, what folks are up to in the literature. So a more terrible summary is to say that cognitive states on this view represent multiple outcomes and their associated probabilities. Okay? So the outcomes and their probabilities are what feature in the representational content when you ascribe representational content. The Shannon information is associated with that content. Okay? It's not represented but it's associated with that content. Once you have that content in place, then um, Shannon's measures apply. Okay? So the individual outcomes have associated Shannon information. The individual outcomes which are represented have associated information. The content as a whole okay, is going to have associated um, average information. It's not clear exactly what use this measure is going to be in this, in this particular case, but perhaps it has a use. And if you have two representations, then there's going to be associated joint Shannon, conditional Shannon, and mutual Shannon information between um, their contents. Um, and there are actually interesting ways of um, describing algorithms in cognitive neuroscience or algorithms that folks attribute to the brain in terms of um, these quantities, okay, quantities that apply to um, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the representational content. So cognitive states represent, we're assuming that for the sake of argument, they represent multiple outcomes and associated probabilities. Therefore, the content has information, Shannon information theoretic properties. And those are Shannon information theoretic properties are independent, quite separate from the information theoretic properties associated with the vehicles, which are relevant to Dretzky and so forth. So cognition. Um, is information processing in a new sense. Now, um, I'm going to skip. I have an interesting enough case study here on um, um, uh, a particular um, type of uh, probabilistic inference and how that probabilistic inference brings along Shannon information and how um, to answer some of the worries which, or say something about some of the worries um, uh, that uh, were raised yesterday, in particular by Rosa, that um, the Shannon information stuff is not <laughs> necessarily explanatorily idle, and in fact it can actually be um, useful to theorists in describing the dynamics of um, certain cognitive processes. Um, I think I'm just going to skip that to leave time for questions. I'm quite happy to talk a little bit about it in the discussion. Um, so let me just skip through that and just go to the conclusion. So um, I've been trying to um, help us get a little bit clearer about exactly in what sense cognition is information processing. I've emphasized that there's more than one sense in which cognition is information processing. There's a traditional or long-standing sense and a new sense which is emerging in the new kind of probabilistic um, turn in cognitive neuroscience. I think philosophers should pay more attention to this contrast. This isn't something which I've had the chance to argue for in more, more detail. I think self-evidently, um, you know, they should pay attention for the usual reasons of intellectual hygiene that uh, philosophers are preoccupied with. Um, but I think it's um, kind of important to realize that um, cognitive neuroscience is undergoing this revolution in terms of the role of probability in its models. And that information is, Shannon information just comes along for free on that ride. Okay? Now, what I didn't get a chance to argue for in the, in the case study is that um, sometimes um, uh, uh, a description of what's going on in a, a cognitive process in Shannon information theoretic terms is useful to theorists or serves um, some role of elegantly expressing um, uh, particular dynamics to theorists. Um, so um, this is, again, quite a distinct way in which um, this sense of information, this sense in which cognition is information processing differs from the long-standing sense. The long-standing sense it wasn't really clear at all how Shannon information is relevant to dynamics. Shannon information 
was relevant to getting the representations on board, to getting the states out there, it didn't really have anything to say about the dynamics. You told a separate story about the dynamics. On this view, it turns out that, um, uh, the, that it's going to matter to your description of the dynamics. Um, I wish I could say a bit more about that, but I can't have you to do so in questions. Uh, thank you very much indeed. So we have about 15 minutes for questions. Let's start with Foron. Yeah, thank you, Mao. Uh, I wonder if someone can accept your distinction between all the new cognition, but still say that they are complementary, namely that. Uh, sure. So, uh, namely that uh, uh, on the one hand you say, okay, representation uh, uh, represent uh, multiple outcomes with associated probabilities, but now we have to say, uh, to, to uh, characterize the content of the specific representation, and then we can go to the old sense of, you know, the, uh, uh, and if it is so, so we have something uh, weird here that we use Shannon information in, this, in two different senses in the definition of what representation is and what is the content of representation. So you agree, I mean? I, so I, yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, I completely agree. So I don't think that these two senses are in tension with each other or, or at least in any obvious way competing with each other. So um, um, as I said on, on, on the kind of the, what I've described as, as a, the new view, the content-based view, um, you just assume that you've already solved the problem of uh, representation or you at least don't worry about that. Um, so it's compatible with that view that you solve that problem using some variant of informational semantics. Um, it's also compatible with that view that you solve it in a, in a different way. Um, and I think it, you know, it is an interesting result that you know, if it turns out that Shannon information is going to enter into two, it's going to matter to con cognition in two completely distinct ways. It's going to feature in the content and it's also going to um, feature in the, um, the, the, the occurrence of the vehicles. And, the story about how that content appears in the first place. But I definitely don't want to suggest these um, two senses are, are, are in any way in competition with each other. So we have Nia now. Thank you very much, Mark. It was super interesting. I just want to clarify. So you think that uh, we as theorists uh, every time that we attribute to an organism, not just a person, uh, representation or representational content, then the cognitive mechanism has something to do with uh, hypothesis testing or Bayesian inference, etc. Um, so I definitely don't want to say that this um, is, uh, uh, necessitates you having a Bayesian view. Um, so the idea that um, cognition involves probabilistic representations is a much, much more general position than the very specific Bayesian one. The Bayesians are kind of the most numerous and most vocal group at the moment and have been the best at um, explaining the merits of a probabilistic approach. Um, but um, there are lots and lots of folks who think that um, probabilistic representations are important and adaptively important to cognition. Um, that uh, are not Bayesians, and the, the kind of the informal motivation that I gave about the organism simply being a position of having noisy and uncertain, sorry, noisy and incomplete information about the environment and how it would make sense for such an organism to have a probabilistic representation of the environment. That's totally independent from any kind of Bayesian um, commitment. Um, so you could be a Bayesian, you might, you, you, you might not be. Um, um, So, <laughs> so wait, sorry, sorry. Ron first. <coughs> yeah, I just, I just want to make sure that I got your response to the first question because I think mine is similar. So, I mean, when you say, look, it's not a matter of uh, <clears throat> the probability of the vehicle, but. Um, you know, the co it uh, deals with the content. But I mean, you know, I can easily imagine, a, say, a neuron that fires at various frequencies in a visual system. And each frequency corresponds to a kind of, you know, state of the world where that state is, uh, you know, such and such with probability P, such and such with probability Q, so on and so forth. And I mean, that's the informational content. It's just this kind of list of probabilities of the value of some variable out in the world. Um, and, you know, there's the occurrence or non-occurrence of this signal. So we're talking about a vehicle. Um, what's, 
you know, so how is this not a, I mean, do you think that's, there's something problematic with thinking that way? I mean, the signal just changes the probabilities of these various world states, and in so doing, you know, that signal carries information about a state of the world that, you know, is, is sort of characterized by uh, these different pop probabilities of, of the, uh, yeah, like I said, source taking on these various properties. So, I mean, is that, is that different than the idea that Shannon information's entering at two levels? Because the way I just said it there, it's not obvious that it's entering at two levels. It's just there's this kind of, you know, correlation between a signal in the head and some state of the world where that state is characterized by, you know, various probabilities. Um, so, so it's, it's, it's a good question and, you know, it may be that, you know, it, it seems a, a sensible thing to investigate whether that there is a relationship between the kind of probabilistic contents which are attributed and the, uh, the probabilities associated with the, uh, whether the vehicle occurs or not under various circumstances. Um, I don't think that there necessarily needs to be a connection between those two. Um, so, I guess, you know, fo fo following your line of thought, like maybe you have a clearer view than I on how, you, how you're going to solve the problem of representation, but um, your view is that you're going to get probabilistic content purely in virtue of the vehicle um, occurring or not occurring with the relevant probabilities. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's difficult to say whether, you know, I, I don't think that that's going to be, you know, if that, if, if that was the way in which we could solve the problem of content, that would be, that would be wonderful. Um, I don't think that's the way in which you can solve the problem of content. One, one reason is that there's going to be you know, the problem of liberality, which I mentioned earlier, that you're going to have relations between two random variables, which are going to be very, very common, but you don't want to say that one random variable represents the other or that it has probabilistic representation of the other, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I... So, so, so that's, that's one kind of worry. The, the other worry is just thinking about the kind of practice in which ways, you know, there, there are all sorts of different ways in which folks attribute probabilistic representations to um, cognitive agents. In many cases, they um, aren't really saying anything about where the vehicles are or what sort of things the vehicles are. So they attribute these probabilistic representations and say these are, these are realized somewhere or other in the brain. I'm not going to you know, deal with that sort of implementation. Um, other folks focus on the implementation and say that, I don't know, the rate of firing of this kind of population is a representation of um, you know, whether this um, group of dots is moving uh, at this at, at a given velocity, it's a probabilistic representation of the, of the velocity of the dots moving. Mm -hmm. Now, the relationship between the activity there and the representational content is often very, very convoluted. So there's often some quite complicated either encoding or decoding function to get from one to the other. Um, so I think if, if you look in, in the practice of how folks actually attribute these um, um, these uh, um, uh, probabilistic representations to specific neural populations or single neurons um, in certain cases. Um, there's often the mapping between the two is often a lot more convoluted and complex than just whether whether the vehicle is is occurring or not, whether it's like, whether, whether whether a particular neuron fires or not, or the rate at which it fires. It's often some complicated function of that. Um, so, th so this is a very long-winded way to say that it's a really, really interesting question. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's obvious, at least to me, that um, if you go down the route of probabilistic representations, ha having probabilistic content, that's going to help you immediately with solving the problem of how those representations get content at all. It's going to help you with the original problem. Well, I think it's, you know, it's a good hypothesis to investigate. Okay. So now we have uh, Eva, Mark, and Michael in this order. Yes, uh, I think that uh, what you presented as a representation, you, you were talking about mental representations and trying to, to give an account of those. 
But I think that what you gave account is of something else, of something more general maybe. Because if I'm thinking, for example, about a cell with DNA, I can say that the DNA has representation. It has a generative model which produces hypotheses in the forms of all kinds of, uh, of, net, uh, of uh, cellular net networks, which are then stabilized uh, uh, differentially. And in this sense, you can say that development is uh, at, uh, that uh, the, the, the genome is a, is a generative model. It, it, it is this, the four representations, which are hypotheses, particular uh, manifestations of the activity of this genome, which are then uh, stabilized and, uh, and, uh, and have functional context in different. So I don't, so I think that, the, and this is a, possib a possible way of, uh, of describing uh, this in, in the terms that you were talking about, the Friston terms, basically. And, uh, and so, what I, I want to ask, so there are two questions here. One is, if you're thinking about uh, an organism, not a neural organism, let's, uh, uh, if, even a non-neural organism, then you can say, you can think about it in this terms, and f furthermore, if it's a, uh, you can think about the morphology of the organism as part of the input in, into the model. And so one thing that I want to ask you is, what is the difference between the hypothesis and the constraint? And the other question that I want to ask you is, what is special about mental representation as distinct from any other kind of representation? Okay, thank you very much. That's, uh, that's really helpful. Um, so I haven't thought about, um, I confess at all, about the case of, of, of DNA. And I think it's, yeah, it's really interesting to think of the genome as a, as a generative model. Um, uh, so... I guess um, whenever we're attributing representations to systems, uh, we might be doing different things in different kinds of contexts. So what I've been assuming throughout in this case is that whenever um, folks in cognitive neuroscience attribute um, representations to um, the brain or parts of the brain, um, what they are doing is uh, doing something in a, in a kind of a, broadly speaking, realist vein. They think that the, the representations are, are kind of really, really there. And, um, you know, this is, this is kind of the, the mechanism, the nuts and bolts by which the, the, organism, the organism operates. Um, in the case of um, DNA, I, I can imagine that um, certain folks, in fact, I know certain folks in, in cognitive neuroscience who think that... Um, this is, um, should not be understood in a, in a realist vein at all. Uh, they can say that, uh, that it's extremely useful uh, for various purposes when modeling to attribute these probabilistic representations or representations of other sorts. But um, this is kind of a ladder to be kicked away and it has all sorts of cognitive virtues, but it doesn't really commit us to um, organisms really having, having these kinds of representations. Um, now, there's a kind of a, a, a trade-off there or a play-off between um, whether, you know, the right position is going to be realism about, about representation or, or some form of anti-realism about representation. And the, um, I think that the, the, the kind of the orthodox view in, in cognitive science is, is some form, some default form of realism about representations. I'm not sure if the same is going to play out in, 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 in other contexts, so I'm could imagine that um, considering um, uh, um, uh, DNA's representation and the genome as a generative model um, might have all sorts of different cognitive virtues for a theorist. Um, I'm not sure whether they are, uh, or, or, or whether folks working in that area uh, would um, consider that the default option is, or the default position is, is going to be some form of realism about those representations. Um, Sorry, sorry, we have only three minutes and two more people. So, Mark, let's switch keep both questions and answers short. Thanks. So, um, I'm, I'll try to be very short. So, uh, thanks for this wonderful talk. I have many questions, so, uh, but I'm just going to raise one. So, I want to um, try to challenge the idea that you're actually like um, talking about a different kind of information. Now, you can, I mean, there are two things. So, one is you can, so, you, so, so two things could be happening. One is that like these naturalistic guys, they are using a different notion of information. The other is that you are mentioning the same kind of information, it's just that they are using two naturalized representations where you are not. So you were saying that you were talking about two different kinds of information. And I, let me try to challenge this thing. So, so um, you said, well, according to these guys, um, you know, they, they are interested in information of the vehicle. 
right? But that's not, of course, that's not the first sense of information you mentioned. They're not interested in the, the, informa the information that an outcome, the vehicle, you know, the fact that the vehicle is token carries about, you know, not about the ensemble of vehicles. So they're interested about the information that the vehicle carries about the thing of the wall, right? So they talk about mutual information. So they're not interested in the, inf the information of the vehicle, but the information that the vehicle carries about the state of the wall. So that's the kind of information they talk about. And this, I mean, this, this, the kind of, you say, well, these guys, are the, the new guys, <laughs> the, the scientific guys are interested in the information of, related to the content. But of course, it's not just the, the information that, you know, that um, states carry about you know, the state of other states of the world, it's information that once the, the, this neural state is tokened, what's the probability distribution of the state of the world? So you're, you're also talking about information that states carry about the, the states of the world. So it seems that in both cases, you're talking about information that, new, you know, the fact that the neural state holds carries about the, the state of the world. And then you mention a couple of differences. So one is that, well, according to this probability distribution approach, um, you don't have accuracy conditions. It seems that you do have accuracy conditions, so you might misrepresent the probability distributions. So you may represent a thing that is highly probable as being, you know, at not having very high probability, that will be kind of inaccuracy. And you also mentioned the fact, and that I conclude with that. <laughs> so the fact, so it seems that the fact that you are, um, that is a probability distribution is what is playing a big role in your argument. But, you know, following a Skirmian, you know, schemes way of thinking, you might suggest that they just, you know, like representing a state as being the case is just an extreme case of representing a probability distribution. You're representing one state as having probability one and the other state as having probability zero. So there might be a continuous between, um, you know, representing a single state and representing a probability distribution. So yeah, that's... that's okay, so <laughs> that's, that's terrific. There's a lot there. Let, let me try and rattle through it as quickly as possible. Um, so um, I definitely didn't want to suggest that there are two senses of information at play. So there's only one sense of information, Shannon information, but it's being used in two quite distinct ways in, 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 in cognitive science. Um, so you said that there's... Um, M moving on as quickly as I can to the second point, which is that um, you said that there's something funny going on about information about information. Okay. Um, so I think that it's easy to get kind of tangled up by using the term in information here because there's, um, you know, there's, there's a, it's natural, to, it's very easy to make the slip between Shannon information and information in terms of semantic content. Um, so information about doesn't apply to Shannon information, okay? There's no information about. There's information, Shannon information associated with various outcomes, but information about isn't something which um, <coughs> is, is, is valid to, to, um, to, to, to use for Shannon information, in, uh, at least taken in its, you know, its, in its own terms. Um, one way of thinking about it to try and disentangle the two senses is stop talking about information, just talk about the probabilities. And there are two kinds of probabilities at issue here. There's the probabilities of the vehicle occurring, and there's the probabilities represented by the vehicle, so the probabilities across the various outcomes in the environment that the vehicle is representing. So there are two different probabilities in play here, and therefore there are two different, um, 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 uh, there are two different channel information, two different things which have channel information. There's the vehicle and there's the content. Um, uh, you mentioned about the, um, that it makes sense to say um, that um, there are accuracy conditions as well for probabilistic representations. So I, in no way did I want to suggest that um, uh, uh, probabilistic representations couldn't be more or less accurate. Of course they can. Uh, and, you know, it's an interesting project to uh, describe exactly what, what counts as a, uh, as, as a good probabilistic representation. Um, what I just meant to say is that the standard way, philosophical way, or um, uh, standard way in philosophical logic of cashing out what an accuracy condition or what a truth condition is in terms of possible worlds, whether something is true or false in possible worlds, that doesn't apply in the case of a probabilistic representation, or at least it needs to be significantly modified to accommodate the fact that you're also associating a probability mass with various different outcomes. Um, so, um, so I definitely want to keep the idea of accuracy for probabilistic representations. Um, and uh, just trying to read my writing here. Uh, can you remember the, the last point? Yeah, so, so yeah, perhaps we can keep uh, discussion during coffee, otherwise coffee is getting cold. So <laughs> thank you very uh, much. Let's thank the speaker once again.